Testing. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Introducing our speaker, JT Nelson. You can find him in his, uh, his website at SoCalBlender.org, right? Yes, yeah, SoCalBlender.org and in association with LA.Blend user groups. Without further ado. Let's back up. There we go. Um, let's turn down the volume a little bit here. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. There we go. Testing one, two. You guys can still hear me? All right. They don't have tape for these, uh, for these mics. Typically, you tape them up so they don't rattle like that. Sorry about that. So, say what? Yeah, that's what I got it practically. Uh, it's squeezed pretty good here. So, all right. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I'd like to get a really quick um, overview of who's in the room. We have programmers in here. Raise your hand. Anybody that programs? Okay, any artists? Who's the artists in the room? Artists, a couple artists. Anybody actually working for Hollywood or the game industry already? No? Cool, there's lots of opportunity. There you go, working on it, good. Lots of opportunity for uh, people who are programmers to work in Hollywood in the game industry. They're dying. There's no real job board or anything. You gotta look at Indeed and a few other things and just put out the word. If you're local here or even if you're remote, ton of work. The um, reason I start out with that is because Ubuntu is all about the community. It's all about the people. And um, as you already saw on my second slide, people are the secret sauce. It's one of the things you'll see uh, in this talk as I go through and I show some slides. You'll see me talking about organizations, and it's all about the people that are driving it. And it's the same spirit as Ubuntu. Um, and I'll jump ahead just a little bit. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm doing and it's being done in Hollywood wouldn't be able to be done without Ubuntu server in the cloud, period. Um, the ability to collaborate and network people from all over the world, all over the country, uh, is happening um, because the Ubuntu community has solutions. When you go to the cloud, you've got people, they've got deadlines, they've got jobs they need to do. The, the reason it's happening is because if me or someone else who's helping out these studios putting up servers in the cloud, if, if we get stuck, we got people to go to. If not, we got the Ubuntu, Ask Ubuntu website, Ubuntu community. The answer's always there somewhere. And that's the key. You don't want to get stuck. So we're really excited about the community. And it's just one of the uh, additional things that prove people are, in fact, a secret sauce in all of this in Hollywood. And it's allowing people to tell their stories. And that's part of what I'm going to talk about in the democratizing part about Hollywood. Um, right away, I'm going to go to some of the players. Uh, since it's all about people. Um, I apologize, I can't really show you a lot of Hollywood clips and things that are being done because this recording is being streamed and it's uh, uh, being put out there for posterity and we're running at a lower resolution. So I'm gonna give you some stuff to search on. And when you search this stuff, look at their media in high definition or high resolution, it is absolutely astounding in the work's being done. First one is Artella. They're not really big into open source. They actually promote Maya, but they're into democratization of Hollywood. This virtual studio movement is really gaining steam, and those are going to be the first few groups that I talk about. And some of these virtual studios I'm helping out were using Ubuntu server. And again, for what I said just a few moments ago, um, Artel is awesome. It's out of South America, and what they're doing with this virtual studio is anybody who basically wants to be an artist or wants to be a programmer, they're all getting together on specific websites, and they're combining their forces to do special animation or video projects or film projects. And you'll see that's a current theme in the first part of my presentation. And out of South America, they've got this setup to where basically you can have your own virtual Hollywood-type studio through a website. So you can be in the middle of nowhere, anywhere in the world really, definitely in South America, and um, you can be working with a team of people here in Hollywood, people in South America, people in China, people in Russia, people in Europe. This is really big in France and Germany, and um, it's really exciting. Yeah, so there's no real limits. You just have to put your team together, and they help with the production pipeline. So you can have like a Hollywood-type full production pipeline all in one website. You don't have to load software on your computer. It's really exciting. Um, how I know about this gentleman is he showed up at SIGGRAPH and did a presentation on pipelines. And um, 
virtual studios and remote collaboration. Outstanding, artella.com. Definitely somebody you want to look at, a site that you want to look at, follow who's doing productions there. And again, go to their website, look at it on your screen in high resolution, and you'll really be impressed of the quality. Now, what are the things with democratizing Hollywood? Well, what is that? in the game industry. What is democratizing? Well, part of democratizing is decentralizing. Well, what is decentralizing? It means you don't have to come here to Hollywood and be hired by a Hollywood studio to do Hollywood caliber production. You can actually do it in a platform like this and some of the other platforms we're going to talk about. And now, because of YouTube, you get seen, or other distribution channels, you get seen. So it's a real even playing field from the bottom up, from general people from the bottom up. Same thing with Ubuntu and uh, Canonical and Ubuntu software. You start from the bottom, those people contribute, and then they build up towards the top. Much more different of a paradigm than Hollywood where you start with the power brokers in Hollywood and they get to decide who makes what movie, who makes what animation, and then it trickles back down. And if you're lucky, you get selected. The Academy Awards were just on, and what did they say the whole time? Oh, thank you for letting me make my movie. Thank you for letting me make my movie. Thank you for letting me make my movie. That's not our paradigm in open source. That's not our paradigm with Linux. That's not our paradigm with Ubuntu. Everybody, me, everybody gets to make their movie, and then you share it on one of the social media, your Facebook feed, uh, YouTube, whatever. Um, Hulu's getting really big on it. Crackle's really big on independent film, things of that sort. So that's basically what I mean by democratizing and decentralizing. Um, and it's not only happening in Hollywood, it's happening in the game industry. So let me show you a couple more players here. Theory Studios, this is one of the groups that I'm directly related with. Um, David Andrade started that. He was with uh, Rhythm and Hughes. And as a lot of you know, Rhythm and Hughes had a massive layoff. And then they went and um, closed shop. So these people were basically let go, basically fired by Hollywood. Hollywood said, we don't need you anymore. So they said, well, what do we want to do? And I remember there was a sparkle in David Andrade's eye. He said, you know what? I think maybe we'll form a virtual studio. And I just kept egging him on, saying, do it, do it, man, do it. You know, it's worth it. It's worth it. This is going to work. This is several years ago. Lo and behold, he ended up doing Theory Animation, morphed into Theory Studios. And um, they're in conjunction with Barnstorm, which I'll talk about in a minute. And now they've got people from all over the world collaborating. And they are a Blender house. They use Blender primarily. They use several other open source and some proprietary software. And they have a beautiful solution. And they're making things happen. Uh, what's really cool is the group that they're making things happen with is Barnstorm Visual Effects. Uh, outstanding company, uh, Lawson Dimming. He comes to our SoCal Blender uh, user group meetings on the west side. Real supporter of our group. Very, very ardent supporter of open source and Blender. They have a very good reputation around town. And um, you see here, uh, I stopped the movie on the clip for Man in the High Castle. Man in the High Castle was nominated for an Emmy, and it was primarily this work with the, uh, I think it's called, pronounced Volkshaw. It's this big building that the Germans and Hitler conceived of, where this huge hall where people come in. Uh, all those scenes were done in Blender, and they were done in combination with uh, Barnstorm visual effects and theory animation. And Blender was the primary tool on that. Uh, they worked with the industry. They worked with Massive. People do crowd sims. Uh, so there's a fantastic bridge that's happening between uh, the professional and proprietary community with open source. They understand the value. So they've been really supportive of Blender. Several other professional tools, there's bridges to Blender. I'll talk about it in a minute. And uh, fantastic. These are basically the people we like to support. They're part of our group here in LA. And, um, they provide tools that anybody and everybody can use. So people actually volunteer on passion projects that are not paid projects. They get affiliated with the studio. And then between Theory and Barnstorm, they're being able to be pulled into out of the amateur status and actually professionally start working on stuff in Hollywood. This is community, you know, and this is part of what we're talking about, democratizing Hollywood. Just some person who happens to have had a cool portfolio or a cool piece gets invited on a volunteer project. They really enjoy the volunteer project, that people notice them on the volunteer project, and then all of a sudden they get picked for a paid project, and then they're working on something uh, for Barnstorm and Theory that gets a, a nominated for an Emmy. Um, they didn't win the Emmy, um, hopefully next year. So, 
All right, another group, fantastic, is again, people, Hollywood decided they didn't need them anymore because they weren't making them any money. They closed down the original PDI studio, which was actually DreamWorks up in the Bay Area. So a bunch of the DreamWorks people said, well, we're unemployed, now what do we do? So they ended up coming up with a game plan, moved to Silicon Valley, and got over $8 million to start Nimble Collective. Okay, eight some odd million, I don't know, they probably got more. Uh, Jason Schiffler, fantastic community, real big supporter of Blender. Blender is their core technology. What they do at Nimble is very interesting, a little bit different than Artella. Artella kind of does the project management, does a platform for viewing, things of that sort. Nimble, basically they have this cute little video if you go on their website, where I think it's actually even Jason, he's in a chicken suit on his couch, using a Chromebook and editing an animation online through Nimble's platform. And they joke that it's just, you can do whatever you want to to do Nimble, because you basically need a, a simple computer, you go on a website, and all of a sudden now you have this platform for production, you have an asset store, and things of that sort. It's, it's, I think it's still in beta right now. I think you have to be invited, or you ask them, they let you in. Eventually, they'll figure out a subscription model. But it's all done on the back end. It's all server-based. It's all cloud-based. Now, I don't work with them directly in their technology. I don't know if they use Ubuntu in the cloud. I will tell you, most people do. Ubuntu in Hollywood is one of the rock-solid uh, platforms that are used. And I help out all the time. CentOS is the other big one. Uh, one of the reasons they use CentOS is because there's a, uh, you can use Red Hat technical support. So a lot of Hollywood studios don't want to get stuck. And um, that's why they want someone who can basically solve a problem for them. And uh, Nimble Collective does that because they handle everything on the back end for you. You just have to have a Chromebook. Go up to a website. It's very responsive. You run Blender. You can run Maya and anything else. Basically, it's a Citrix client is what it is. They're in partnership with Citrix. Um, so you get that speed. As long as you have a decent internet connection, you're good to go. They got a full pipeline. Store your assets. Save your assets. Work with the team. You can see here you can do the same thing as Artella. If you want to start up your own virtual studio, you can start up your own virtual studio. Um, if you have an existing studio, you can use this cloud platform to go ahead and uh, manage your project. So very, very exciting. Again, what's really neat is they don't have to hire employees. If you have a project, even if an existing studio has a project, you find somebody in the community, you really like their artwork, say, hey, join our Nimble Collective project and work on this project with us. We'll give you credit. We can't pay you, but we'll give you credit. They end up getting credit for working with people from Hollywood, and next time they get paid. So this is what we mean by democratization. Uh, with the game industry, it's the same way. Um, I can't show you any of the stuff because it's been recorded, um, but ILM, um, there was a gentleman who used Blender in my particular branch that I work with, Fraction Modifier, one of the developers. And um, he goes over to Electronic Arts and says, hey, I'm working on this Fortnite game. We're doing the trailer. I hope you guys use Blender because that's what I'm using for the trailer. And what Fraction Modifier does is you, uh, you blow things up, you break things up with it. And they found two other guys that use Blender. So there's three guys, and they gave us a lot of love on a podcast they had a while back. And what they do, though, is they draw this information from the community, from forums. They go in, they go into the gamers, and that's where he found out about the Fracture Modifier. And he found out, wow, I can bust stuff up really easy. And I'm talking at 1 o'clock in the Libra Graphics in Hall C if you want more information about the Fracture Modifier. But it's this bottom-up grassroots for the people in the community is where the information's coming from and going back up into Hollywood. So a guy from ILM is using uh, the Fracture Modifier branch of Blender, and he's basically goes to Electronic Arts in their premier game that they released. He used it and gave us a lot of love in a webcast. Outstanding. We, we were loving it. The team was loving it. And um, another group is a group that I'm affiliated with here. It's a local project. We're doing something to where it's similar. We have a, a simpler um, production management platform. But basically, we've uh, Rex Fatah and another developer has started um, opensourcehollywood.org. You can also find it on meetup.com. And what that is is basic project management, and you put together groups like Kickstarter and Indiegogo for funding your project and assembling your people. So you have a profile, things of that sort. And it's the same concept. You basically want to find the rest of your virtual studio, the rest of your group, or it could be a local group, all your local people, and what's great about this one, as opposed to the other ones, is this operates on your phone. 
Okay, it's a phone, it's a mobile platform. So not only does it operate on a website, it operates on your phone. So basically, you can go like this. Oh, I think I'm gonna produce a video or I'm gonna produce a uh, animation next week. Or I'm gonna do an audio recording. Or I'm gonna record a concert. Get on your phone, sign into your open source Hollywood account. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, boom. Here we go, here's my project, post my project. Oh, who do I want on my project? Uh, let me see, yeah, I like that person, let me invite them. I like this person, let me invite them. Oh, and I've posted and people see it and people can say, hey, can I work on your project? And start project. You're done on your phone. So you're producing, starting up projects on your phone. <laughs> that's fantastic. Why? Because it gives all local producers, anybody that's not a Hollywood studio, it gives you that power still from the bottom up. And even the studio, studios recognize that the next Spielberg or the next... Uh, James Cameron basically are the people out here in audiences like this, you know, but they need something that's not a roadblock. They need something that's a facilitator. And with open source and with communities like we have now that are developing, you have those roadblocks removed. It's, it's low to no um, barrier access to this stuff. Um, I'm also working in conjunction, my group, we work in conjunction with Pasadena Media. It's three blocks from here. It's a community media TV station. Okay, we're providing the same thing. You can come to any of my classes there. You can become a producer there. I post on our, our meetup group for Open Source Hollywood, our training, we give free training. And you can get started producing TV programs and then move into film, two, three blocks away from here. What's cool about that is it's a brick and mortar location that gets attached to these virtual locations. So we have the advantage of we've got places to meet. So if anybody's interested and they want to take a tour, let me know and I'll walk you over there. It's three blocks away. We'll go over, see what they're doing, walk into the studio. Uh, it's a TV studio. And, um, and you'll see brick and mortar. And, and they've embraced this virtual studio concept also. So we've combined with them. So it's really exciting community uh, because they get the vision of we just need to empower people at every level, especially the... The uh, ground troops, the people right out here in the community, and it's, it's not about somebody off in some distant office somewhere making the decisions. You're getting rid of the middlemen. Uh, you're taking the people that have the talent, people that have the desire, and putting them straight up to where their products are done, their production's done, their story's told, and people get to see it. So, And again, I already mentioned a little bit, how are we doing this? Like I said, one of the things that's driving the cloud is open source. You guys know that if you've been paying attention at all. We would not have the cloud if it wasn't open source, period. It just wasn't gonna happen. Every vendor lock was killing the idea of the cloud. The cloud is now open source. What do I use? What do I promote in Hollywood? And what do I see in Hollywood in the game industry? A lot of stuff, when it's cloud, when it's virtual, we go to Ubuntu, Ubuntu server, uh, other variations of it. Um, I'm actually working on a device myself with Ubuntu server. This computer that I'm putting this presentation on has never been on the internet and it never will be on the internet. I'm doing an experiment. And uh, because it's a Hollywood computer and there's uh, intellectual property and property rights uh, material on here, I don't want it to be able to be exploited on the internet. So I have Ubuntu server on a Raspberry Pi and it hooks up via direct IP address and it access my firewall, my proxy and everything and it isolates me from the internet because it all goes through a hardened Raspberry Pi, okay? Wouldn't be able to do it without Ubuntu server, without being able to go to the forums, finding solutions, finding answers, the little tiny things that stop you. Getting those answers fixed, and all of a sudden, bam, you know, you've got a solution. Um, next year, if I get uh, asked back to present next year, I'll be able to showcase that. So I'll have that ready uh, for prime time, and, and that'll, be, um, that'll be basically uh, something I think that's going to gain a lot of traction. Because when you work here regularly with people in the industry, you know, you find out what their pain points are. And if you can fix those pain points, it really helps. So, all right. The other distro that I use is another Ubuntu flavor, is I love Ubuntu. Right now, you can see I left my window open. You can see I'm actually on Windows. Okay. I frequently run Ubuntu most often, but I'm wanting to give props. Ubuntu's great. Fantastic. Do some real cool stuff. Fraction modifier development. I develop on a Windows computer. VirtualBox, Lubuntu, and that's what my development for the Fraction Modifier is done on for coding. And I love the solution, very quick, very easy to install, and uh, gets the job done. I'd like to give some love to Ubuntu Studio. Um, I used to be a big supporter a few years ago. Um, I'm gonna go back to it now because it's such a good solution. And that's what I'm actually doing this presentation on. As you can see, I'm doing it on a Windows computer, 
running Ubuntu Studio in VirtualBox, and that's what this presentation is being done on. I will tell you something interesting, is when it's set up properly, I actually get faster performance. This is a gaming computer, by the way, with a, with a powerful NVIDIA graphics card, lots of memory, uh, SSD drive, and all that jazz. I get faster performance with VirtualBox and Ubuntu on this computer than native Windows. So it actually, it benefits me to install VirtualBox, install Ubuntu, and I get faster performance. It's a faster operating computer than the native Windows on this computer. So pretty much the native Windows is virgin, never been hooked up to the internet, got it all blocked, been through uh, VBox and uh, Ubuntu. I can access another Ubuntu server directly through a uh, IP connection and, uh, and provide it that way. Like I said, if I get invited back next year, I'll share that technology or look out for it online. So now, back to Hollywood. Shotgun was purchased by uh, one of the big players in Hollywood. One of the reasons it originally grew in traction is it had an open source front end. Now this, because of that, it's very fractured, kind of like Android, where you have too many people doing too much stuff with Shotgun, so the interface is like all over the place. So stuff gets hidden, you can't find it. So there's a little bit of a, a, a user experience issue with it. But it doesn't matter. Once people nail their, um, their intent with the software, uh, they may have to actually hire somebody who strictly uses Shotgun and works with Shotgun. Um, but they can customize their whole front end, and Hollywood loves this. So they manage productions. You see some of the biggest names. Uh, Weta Digital is really big. They use this. Uh, CBS Digital. Um, really, a lot of the bigger companies in Hollywood use it. And anybody can, it's Python driven. The user interface is Python driven. Anybody can do their own custom workflow and they're good to go. And this was fantastic. So, one of the big players in the industry bought them out. And, uh, but the bottom line is they get the job done for the people. Why? Because the people are the secret sauce. So, um, and, and that has to be the concurrent theme. You'll see in this next part of my presentation how I'm really going to drive that home. So, um, but it's a very interesting case. Here's proprietary blended with open source. They use Python. So basically, if you're a bigger studio and working with them, you can customize your workflow to where you make the job easier for people and they can meet their deadlines. Uh, they can go home and they can visit with their family. They don't have to work these crazy 20-hour days. They may still sometimes. Um, but basically, they have a tool that does what they need to do. Wouldn't be able to be done without open source. Wouldn't be able to be done. If, I mean, vendors are great. Autodesk is great. They do some fantastic stuff. But there's such a lag between what you need and, what they, and when they provide it. Where with open source, that lag frequently is gone. Uh, I did something for a TV studio. They called me up and said, oh, man, we're dying. We need this tool. Three hours later, I emailed them the tool. Three hours later. Boom, they have the tool, you know? And, um, and that's the power of open source. Okay. All right, back to the game industry. This little organization, I, I apologize, I can't remember the, the people that started it. Um, if you go to go.engine.org, this basically is gonna give Unity a run for its money. Unity is one of the primary uh, game development platforms. These guys at Godot are going nuts. Mozilla's giving them money. They've got crowdfunding. Uh, they do some fantastic development for the game industry. Basically, for free, you have a game engine, not only that you can use, you can alter for what you or your small studio wants and you can basically port a video game to all the major targets, to Android phones, to iOS, to the web, HTML5. Fantastic product, fantastic. And it just keeps growing. Just this last year, they, um, um, they added some tremendous features. What is this? It's, again, democratization and decentralization. You don't have to go to Unity. Unity's fantastic, Unreal's fantastic, Unreal open source their code. It's not... FOSS, but it's open sourced, uh, it's all great. So organizations like this, organizations like Blender, organizations like Godot, they're basically driving, I think, the industry to open source their software or give away free versions of their software. Again, that's democratizing Hollywood because any of us and all of us can use and learn that software because we want what it produces. And with YouTube and some of these other platforms, Hulu, 
Crackle that does independent film. There's ones popping up right and left. You can get your work seen. Now, something really interesting um, with the Godot engine, there's a buddy of mine, Sam Vila. He's a real big uh, advocate of open source. He's one of the people that founded the LA Blend group with me, uh, Sterling Getz, and um, Sean Kennedy. Uh, we do Blender meetings out of the west side. Uh, Sterling Getz is the lead for that one. I just started up the Pasadena events again, so watch for those. We'll be bringing in Hollywood and studios. Uh, we do some free training, free showcase work. They showcase what they're doing. And um, because Sam is a huge advocate of open source, uh oh, there we go. Because Sam is a huge advocate of open source, um, he pressed this company to start using Godot for their game engine. So you'll see in malls all over the world, and here in Southern California, there's one in um, one of these pods in LA Live. Okay, the technology for interactivity. Uh, this is in uh, Tomb Raider. This was an interactive uh, game, Tomb Raider game that you could play to showcase the, uh, the movie that was coming out. Okay? Um, that's driven with open source software. Open source. Sam's ecstatic because when something needed to be changed, he contacted the Godot developers. He had his developers make the patch and said, hey, here's our patch. We need this. We love your product. We're using it for this cool Hollywood stuff. These movie companies are having us do gamification, and we're putting them in malls. Hey, help us out here. What happened? The Godot people said, yeah, sure. They accepted the patch. It's in the software, and this is what you get. You get people playing in a mall, a major blockbuster movie, and they don't even know about open source is driving the interaction, the user interface of these pods. To me, that's exciting. To me, and Sam's a good buddy of mine. He started out in the industry. Um, using open source, and he's always been an open source advocate, and I'm very privileged to work with him, Sterling, and Sean uh, with the LA Blend user groups here. Um, all the major studios come to our events uh, at one time or another. Uh, most of the boutique studios have people popping in and out. We have them about every two months, and it's just really exciting to see what people are doing, and I wanted to give Sam props uh, that he's just really one of the people helping drive uh, open source adoption in the community. All right, one of the other projects that are fantastic great open source product is Krita. This is cool in your pipeline. This is one of the things that I'm really pushing in Hollywood and a couple other packages is uh, this is a product out of Europe and it's a paint program. Uh, more and more Hollywood is using it. And why are they using it? Why don't they use Photoshop? Well, they do use Photoshop. Um, back to the same reason as Godot. If they need a feature, Krita is really cool because Krita does these little uh, crowdfunding things of, all right, let's let the crowd decide what feature we want. So they do these little things uh, where they set it up. I can't remember exactly how he does it. It's Bot is the guy's name. And, um, and then when you uh, vote for what you want, the community funds it. That's the features that they code and they put into Krita. And if that's not democratization, I don't know what is. And the fact that we've taken away the power brokers in, in Hollywood and the people that are the big, huge corporations, they get to decide what features we get. We took that away in open source and community-based and democratized and decentralized efforts. So it's great, because what they did this last year, the people decided how they wanted to use Creed of this painting program. They funded it, they coded it, and it's good to go. And he just keeps doing that. And a fantastic, um, I'm promoting it a lot in Hollywood, that a couple other things. And um, it's gained a lot of traction on its own. And then we'll see, um, if I come back next year, I'll give you a report and tell you how my efforts this year went. Um, I no longer talk just about Blender primarily. Um, I add Krita in there all the time, Blender and Krita, uh, because I think it's really important. So why? Why is it important to Hollywood? Well, we've already talked about the usability. What if I told you, you get to hire 10 new people for a project, and that's all you can hire because you have to pay licensing fees for every person to have software? What if I tell you, and I don't know this number, I'm making this number up. What if I tell you, I tell you what, on this project we're using open source, and since we don't have to pay any licensing fees, we get to hire 13 people rather than 10 people because we're using open source software. And if we get stuck and we need something custom, we can have it programmed for us. We can have a custom workflow. How about that? Guess what people are saying? I like that idea. <laughs> that's a pretty good idea. Well, let's do it that way. So that's what I'm presenting to Hollywood with Creative. We already do it with Blender. Works out really good with Blender. 
Um, and then I'm just putting Creed in the mix now. Because whenever you're doing something for 3D animation or visual effects, you always have to paint textures, always. So that's why I keep pushing Creed. And, uh, and again, for that same uh, economy type thing, is uh, why pay for more licenses when you can have more people? Why? Because people are what? The secret sauce. You want the people. Why do you want the people? You want the creativity. You want the next Spielberg to pop up. You want the, hey, look at this. Hey, what did you do? How do you do that? What did you do that with? Oh, I did it with an open source piece of software. And that's what's happening. People are getting recognition, not because they're pushing open source first. They're doing projects that are, wow, that's stunning. How did you do that? Well, I use this open source software. Check it out. And that's how it's spreading in Hollywood. And then I'll give you another example of how it's spreading uh, in just a minute here. Uh, but that's one of the big ways. I do uh, live events. I'm actually a, a senior video engineer, and I'm moving back into film and movie production. And I was one of the first people to ever use VLC Media Player in a live event. So I kept using proprietary software. It kept crashing, locking up, couldn't get it installed. USB sticks were popular way back in the day, so I stuck VLC on a USB stick, started using it. Now, almost never do you ever see a live event or a live event production company that doesn't have VLC automatically installed on their computers. That's the power of open source. Um, I actually, I heard and I saw in the book that VLC is actually here. I can't wait to go talk to them because I signed up to be one of their developers because I'd like to alter a couple things. If not, I'll have my own branch. Um, fantastic software. VLC is a media player, but it's very community driven. Um, uh, same for the same reasons I said before, and it has proliferated now in the video industry. Fantastic tool. So I wanted to give VLC some props. It's used for playback. There's video annotation software that uses it and things of that sort. Um, excellent group. Now, I don't know it, but I want to check it out. I swear that Cadillac is the 3D model of a Cadillac that my buddy, who's one of the fraction modifier developers, Martin Felke, that he made in 3D in Blender. I can't prove it, but if it's not, his Cadillac looks so real that they look identical. So I'm going to check out with these VLC people and see where this Cadillac came from. But it sure looks like Martin's Cadillac. If not, props to Martin. He made a fantastic Cadillac model. We'll have to bust it up in the fraction modifier one of these days. So as you can see, Big Buck Bunny's on the bottom. If you go to SIGGRAPH, anything else, Big Buck Bunny is one of the Blender open source movies. Probably one of the most used pieces of software in the video industry to illustrate video hardware. And you'll see this bunny everywhere. We, do, we used to do Big Buck Bunny sightings uh, on some of our websites, but it's so proliferated nowadays that, and everywhere that we don't really do it as much. But props to Blender in the uh, open source movies in a Big Buck Bunny sighting. So, all right, here's my team. I just mentioned Martin Felke. Um, we're one of the people driving democratization with our tool for visual effects. Uh, this is Albin Merrill's um, airplane crash. Uh, if you go to YouTube, and you search Fracture Modifier, or you search Blender Plane Crash, you'll see some great stuff. This is a very stunning video, um, and it was all done in the Fracture Modifier, which is a tool that's made uh, a real easy workflow to break things up. So the destruction of the airplane was all managed by it, and a very exciting tool. Uh, you wouldn't find a tool like this being used in Hollywood if it wasn't for the team, so my props to the team, because uh, our passion and the fact that we're an open source community, uh, we bring this tool to Hollywood and uh, wonderful workflow. Team is Martin Felke, the primary coder, and Kai Kostak. Uh, if you go to my Blender presentation this afternoon, you'll find out more information about him and his work. There's me and uh, Dennis Fassbender. He actually does a lot of the uh, videos that we have. Him and Kai do most of the videos, do some fantastic stuff. Hollywood has seen the videos, and they love the Fracture Modifier. Um, at SIGGRAPH, our booth for Blender and the Fracture Modifier was packed all three days of the expo. I think I got to leave the booth twice to go get a sandwich at a vending machine that was close by. <laughs> Hollywood just in droves was coming to the booth because they were giving a lot of love to the Fracture Modifier and uh, to Blender and a lot because of uh, the work by Theory Studios, which I mentioned earlier in their Man in the High Castle work. It's one of the things you want to look up on YouTube also is uh, Man in the High Castle. And I'll uh, look up the VFX breakdown, and you'll see a lot of good Blender work. And, uh, and they were giving us a, a lot of love at the booth. And because uh, Alvin Merrill's airplane crash is just absolutely stunning. Just go to YouTube, search Blender airplane crash. 
and it'll come right out. And he said, basically, it's a French visual effects guy, and he said, oh, I had some time, so I took two weeks to learn the fracture modifier. And in two weeks, he created a uh, visual effects masterpiece of a crashing plane. Sorry, I can't play it for you. Uh, I don't have permission to play it for it to be recorded and broadcast out. And I wouldn't want to do it in justice and play it in low res. Uh, it's kind of a waste of time. Uh, but I tell you what, go online, look at in YouTube, search for Blender Airplane Crash, and you'll absolutely be stunned that a free piece of software did this. So Alvin Merrill said, yeah, I want to learn Fraction Modifier. So he took a week just to learn our tool, and he did this. Uh, and we've been riding on his coattails for quite a while now. Outstanding video. Uh, watch it in high res, though. Um, if you want, let me know later. Hit me up. I'll be here uh, all through the conference. Hit me up. We'll sit down on my laptop, and I'll play it for you. If not, just search for it. So again, props to my team. Jim's for Weeby. Uh, because this is a community effort, Jim's used to be with the Lux Render team, and he jumped ship. He's now working with us, the Faction Modifier team. And uh, all these gentlemen are out of Germany, and um, Jim's does all our Linux builds now, and he's working on technology with us to where we're increasing the Linux build of the Fracture Modifier, and we're getting some uh, outstanding speed increases. Uh, just the past couple days, Jens has been online. We all collaborate on IRC chat. Uh, Jens uh, was online talking about CUDA. He's actually done a hack with CUDA, which is what drives the GPUs and gives you a lot of your power. He did a hack on CUDA, and uh, he uses flavors of Ubuntu also. This, this is what we develop on is Ubuntu, by the way. And um, again, because of the stuff I mentioned earlier. He's doing some hacks, and he's getting some tremendous improvements in time. And in Hollywood, if you give somebody three seconds of frame uh, speed up in rendering of a frame, you may have given them $40,000 in that project. For a boutique studio, you don't have $40,000 to spend. So you can only make Hollywood caliber films with open source software. And when we're giving you speed improvements like that and the industry isn't, the big players in the industry aren't, that's a reason you choose open source rather than paying for the software. It's not because it's free. Your time's not free. Saving your time, saving your... $40,000 is one of the numbers I, get, I hear about a lot in the industry. Open source or the speed improvement saved us $40,000. Again, math is all over the place, so it's for different reasons, uh, but it's one of the reasons. And Jens has been a real champion of really giving us some really good and speed improvements with the fracture modifier. And it's a great tool. All right, people are the secret sauce. Not the project, the project's great, Fraction Modifier's great. I wanna give props to my Fraction Modifier team really quick. In this day and age, uh, it's an all German team, I'm the one American, I am absolutely honored to be part of the Fraction Modifier team. I'm absolutely honored that this Sony ImageWork project like a Limbic collaborate with people from all over the world. We're all on an even playing field, there's no my country, your country, we're all part of a team together, okay? It's all us, we have a project, we have a goal, let's work it out together, and I think that's fantastic. I'm just very privileged to be part of a community like that. Olympic, Sony Imagework figured out software is not the secret sauce. So Olympic is an interchange format that they came up with, and they said, hey, there's our internal format. If we give it to the world, I can now work easier with these boutique studios. I can work easier with open source software. I can work easier with transfer, uh, transporting a file from this company to this company. So Sony figured out software is not the secret sauce. People are the secret sauce. So they said, hey, let's empower people. And this is a movement in Hollywood that me and other people are really pressuring them to open source all their software because people are the secret sauce, not the software. So they open sourced the Olympic a while back. Now everybody can exchange information. What's one of the real cool things about Blender is Blender is basically Hollywood in the industry sandbox. When anybody open sources pretty much a technology, uh, for the most part, Blender incorporates it. So everybody can use it on the Blender platform. And uh, so Limbic, me and a bunch of other people got together. Somebody started us out with a stub. A studio provided some stub of their internal hack to get Limbic to work with, uh, I think it was uh, Elf Studios, I think? I'm not sure, it's all, if you look it up, it's all out there. And um, they gave us a step, a core developer picked it up, and uh, me and a bunch of other people in the community jumped on it, started doing testing, and just hammering it. We gave them bug reports so it'd get fixed. Worked with them for about six months. We're getting 
demo files from different uh, studios in the industry to get this thing into Blender. We got Alembic coded, uh, got our first version out. Blender got some money from the industry through the Blender Developer Fund, kept developing it. Uh, the, um, uh, the usability now is, is right up there on import and export. It's, uh, Olympic is a huge file format. It's a point cache type format. But you can now bridge open source software easily to proprietary Hollywood software. And this is one of the tools that we use. Again, why? Sony figured out the secret sauce isn't the software. Secret sauce is the people. Let's enable the people. They gave them a really good tool. Uh, another one is uh, Pixar released universal uh, scene description. Fantastic tool. They released it last year at SIGGRAPH. Hasn't really gotten as much traction as I would like, but it's getting there. Uh, Blender's new 2.8 version uh, took a look at it, took some of the concepts, and basically is turning it into uh, some of the tools in 2.8. Um, I would rather have had Blender uh, engage it more, but this is one of the internal tools from Pixar. Did the same thing. Hey, people are the secret sauce, not the software. They pushed it out to uh, GitHub, made an announcement at SIGGRAPH. Now people are picking up on universal scene description. And what that does is that allows you, um, Olympic allows you to do a animation, a point cache, an animation. So figure running, but that animation is set. Once you have that animation, that's the only way it is. You can't alter the animation. You can, you can color it differently. You can put different texture maps on it, make it look different, but it's still the same animation of a running guy. Universal scene description is a little bit different. It's all the objects in everything and then how they interact. So basically, as your scene is composed, you can put that out in the USD specification. And now you can alter scenes between platforms. It's only been out for a year. Um, hopefully, it'll uh, gain some more traction. Very exciting. Why? Pixar understands the same concept. People are the secret sauce, not the software. Okay, and I'm going to keep pushing that and keep preaching that to them. Um, Brian Savory was with Pixar. I'm going to show you his product in a minute. He's now with uh, AMD with their Pro Render. AMD was all over Blender from the beginning with their Pro Render. They worked directly with Theory Studios and Barnstorm. Fantastic. This basically gives the power of a brand new render that's optimized to run on AMD hardware, and they went all out to make sure, and they even funded a dev to work with us in the Blender community on OpenCL to make sure the acceleration hardware worked. Why? Because they wanted to empower people, because people are the secret sauce. So they got this pro render. Uh, Brian Savory was with Pixar. He's now working with AMD. Brian Savory, a huge advocate of open source. Talked about him some more in a moment. And... Uh, and they're pushing this uh, with the backing of corporate Hollywood and a big hardware company. Fantastic movement. Basically, wouldn't happen if there wasn't a community. Again, they see the democratization and decentralization happening, and they answered. They weren't so friendly a few years ago, but now all of a sudden, they, uh, we had problems with the drivers, problems with the hardware. Over this last year, they fixed that. They put their money where their mouth is, paid for development, got some really cool tools, and we're good to go. Uh, Brian Savory started uh, RenderMan for Blender, which RenderMan is a world-famous rendering engine. Has a fantastic Blender add-on. Again, he's jumped to AMD now, but this is a wonderful project. Other people have taken it up. You get one free version of RenderMan. So this is what open source software is doing. It's driving the adoption of give somebody a starting point, remove the barrier, get them started. You can't run a studio on it, but you can have one free version of RenderMan, and you got Blender for RenderMan, so you got Blender, you got RenderMan for Blender add-on, you got RenderMan for your rendering engine, you're good to go. You're putting unbelievable quality work out there. What does that do? Levels the playing field. People from um, everyday people like us can produce a Hollywood quality animation or visual effects. Fantastic. Very excited about these people. And again, props to Brian Savory for getting that started. Matt Ebb, props to him. He did the 3D Delight, which is very similar to a RenderMan type uh, uh, render, and um, so Matt Ebb, props to him, he got it started, Brian Savory gives him a lot of credit for getting it started, why? It was a person in the community making things happen, that's why we have these tools, that's why we have everyday people making Hollywood caliber film. Um, you can see here, uh, GitHub, I, I prefer uh, GitLab, which is an open source platform, it's actually open source software you can use, um, but a lot of Hollywood uses GitHub. Um, so GitHub's a real supporter of open source so uh, software. And you can see here is Pixar's RenderMan 
uh, that Brian put up, and he gives Matt Epp props on it. Um, and that's what we do. We go to these repos, we find the code, download the code as a developer, we're good to go. So if you have any interest in Hollywood or any platform, do what you normally do. All you developers, go to GitHub, search it, search video editing, search animation, on, and do site colon github.com and see who's doing what, I do it all the time, see who's doing what project and it'll come up. Volunteer, get involved with that project. There's no reason you can't work with Hollywood because here's how you get started. You start submitting patches and then that's how they find you. Then all of a sudden they say, hey, we got this amount of money, want to work for Hollywood, work with us on this project. Because they've noticed you on GitHub making submissions to their project. It works fantastic. Or they notice stuff like our Fracture Modifier pro uh, project. Say, hey, wow, you know, uh, we can see the source code, what you guys do. So that's really good. All right, I'm just about done and I want to open it up to questions too. I do want to give props to our organization, LA.Blend. Uh, Sterling Getz had an idea a few years ago about World Blender Meetup Day of, hey, let's go to Hollywood and let's go to different studios uh, from all over the world. Let's get them together. Let's go to user groups, people that are using Blender. And for 24 hours, let's webcast broadcasts from people all over the world and what they're doing with Blender. Okay? I'm thinking, wow, that's a good idea. So I kept egging Sterling on, egging him on, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. So about five years ago we did it. We've done it every year but one. We skipped it. And uh, it's called World Blender Meetup Day. You can search for it, and you'll find our website. And it's this 17th, this next Saturday, not this coming up Saturday, but Saturday after. And uh, watch the little video, and you can see there's boutique studios all over the world using Blender. There's a couple that will be on there. And that's fantastic. Great for the community. Really excites the community. Last year, we had 3,400 people watching the stream. Hopefully, we'll have a lot more this year. But just search World Blender Meetup Day, and it should all come right up. It's WMBD.info. And uh, really cool stuff. All right. So what are the takeaways? Well, uh, I couldn't really reveal a lot of secrets since this is <laughs> something that's recorded. But, uh, and I have to pick and choose who I tell stuff with because uh, basically some of this is confidential information. Um, but if you want to hit me up, I'll be here afterwards. Um, and we can have conversations if you want to get into the industry, if you're working with studios, uh, and you want to talk about some solutions, things of that sort. Um, I'm open to talk with you guys. Um, but the main takeaway is the big picture, and it's basically the heart and soul of Ubuntu and even the word Ubuntu. It's about the community. It's about people freely giving in the community. It's about the people helping me when I get stuck when we're doing an Ubuntu server installation for a boutique studio that's trying to make a virtual studio setup so they can collaborate with people all over the world. You know, uh, Juan Paul Buza, fantastic um, rigor. Okay, fantastic. Love the guy. Great, love chatting with him online. He's in Argentina. He can't fly out here and live in LA to work. But I tell you what, he can work remotely. So the community helping us do Ubuntu server installations, helping us do these open source tools and collaborating from all over the world, okay? That's what's decentralizing and democratizing Hollywood. Why? Because people out of the middle of nowhere can come up with just as good of a project, maybe even better than Hollywood. And Hollywood knows this. They know it. People even from Pixar, and some you listen to their keynote speeches, they talk about this grassroots. They talk about the community and how the community is producing stuff. Why? Because the tool's not a barrier anymore. Um, what's really cool is, and I'll tell you about one of the things we're doing in the future, something that is not free is electricity. Okay? So here's one of your takeaways. On the cloud, we're trying to get a way for Hollywood studios and other studios to sponsor, if you can't fund it yourself, like through something like Open Source Hollywood, you can't fund your own project, we're trying to get Hollywood to pay for the electricity. What does that mean? That means everybody uses these platforms I mentioned, they make their product, but they have to render it. Rendering costs electricity because it takes weeks, months of time to render an animation. What we're trying to do is we're kicking it around Hollywood, figuring out a way to best do it to where Hollywood can sponsor render time in the cloud. Okay? If they can do that, they pay for the electricity. These boutique studios can realistically render a Hollywood feature film animation. So somebody out of the middle of nowhere can make a feature film animation on par with Pixar if we can get their rendering time paid for. Okay? Um, if not, they have to work it out some other way. But that is one of the stumbling blocks with this. When Hollywood does pick up a project, though, they will give the render time, and it's outstanding to see what happens. 
The other takeaway is because people are the secret sauce, Hollywood is out looking in the community. There's a ton of work. They just don't know how to connect with developers. They need people working on these open source pipelines. Theory needs people. Barnstorm needs people. Several other organizations are looking for people that know Blender, that know open source, that know Python, but they can't find them. Indeed is kind of doing a good job, um, but they can't find these people. So go out and look. If, if you like doing database work, database is used heavily in Hollywood. They need you. And you get to work on film projects, so it's really, really cool. Uh, the other takeaway is keep watching. Keep watching, keep supporting. Uh, you can search on the topic uh, from the talk here, Democratizing Hollywood. Keep searching on it. Uh, my organization, SoCal Blender, is going to uh, launch a new website. And when we do, um, we have a full blog that's going to be going up, and you'll be seeing articles on the subject. Be able to search it, and you'll be able to track this next year. The, uh, the development of democratizing and decentralizing Hollywood. Uh, it's a movement. Like I said, we got a brick and mortar affiliation with uh, Pasadena Media, a community media TV station. So we got a real strong presence here in Southern California. And I've already got other uh, states in the country and other places around the world that are asking about it um, because they're really excited because everybody wants their own little baby Hollywood or their own virtual Hollywood. So I wanted to open it up for questions too. Uh, I kind of didn't take questions while we were talking. I think we got a little bit of time still. Yeah, we have, we have, we have several minutes. Sure. And uh, but before we do that, can we get a quick round of applause? This was a... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In the, many, in the many years that Ubicon's been around, we've had some discussions about uh, tools, but not at this level and not about the scope of community. So uh, I really appreciate your time to prepare this and to bring it here for us today. Thank you. So if you Thanks have a question, um, these talks are recorded for later. Just raise your hand and I'll give you the time. Yes, uh, Michelle Klein Haas, Ms. Geek Media. Uh, I'd like to find out if any of these tool chains would be uh, helpful for uh, producing a live action uh, project. Yes, there's several open source video editors. One of them uses uh, a back end. Uh, of Blender, and you can use Blender's uh, video sequence editor. It does 4K video. You can mm -hmm. do proxy editing. Um, we're working on projects where you can store all your media in 4K in the cloud and use Blender and its proxy uh, capabilities to where you can edit it locally, have the cloud render it for you. So that saves you quite a bit of money. That's You're not great. struggling with 4K That's video. Um, so that would be video editing for live action. But yeah, all these tools use 4K, work with 4K video. Yeah, because so, I, I'm, I'm going to be working with uh, a, a group of people who have a, a network on, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on uh, what's it, uh, a Roku called uh, uh, OSI 74. Sure. It's, it's, the, it's there already, and uh, I, uh, I, I may be doing a show for them, and... Uh, the thing is, is that most of the people involved are on the East Coast. Right. And uh, it's, it, you know, there's, there's so many things that, uh, you know, being able to, to bring the disparate people in OSI 74 together would be very cool. Right. Um, the, the question was, if it didn't uh, get recording or on the broadcast, is about uh, bringing people together in a full studio pipeline. You've got these platforms that I mentioned earlier that you can use, and uh, Blender with a few other tools, you can cobble one together. Uh, but eventually that'll be developed, eventually Hollywood will want, and my group, uh, SoCal Blender, we're working on a cobbled together system, and eventually, because we're right here in Hollywood, we'll probably have a 100% open source version eventually. Uh, which will be great. You'll be able to download the whole platform. If not, there's already these existing platforms. They're like $10 a month. Brilliant. And so they're fantastic, fantastic. Brilliant. You got Nimble and, and the other ones that I mentioned. And um, you got opensourcehollywood.org. Yeah, it's really a movement that's not going to die. It's just going to get even better. Brilliant. So. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? It used to be that uh, Australia had the rendering farms all running Linux. What is that today and where is it? You know, I, uh, one of the core developers of Blinders from Australia, I don't know, there's a disconnect. I went to American film market, talked to American filmmakers. I don't know, I don't hear that. That's not the buzz that I hear. Um, 
But I know there's stuff going on there. I just don't know how to connect with them. I don't know if that's something through the Ubuntu community or who, uh, but I'm not seeing enough of that information. I, I do know that one of the challenges is the amount of data we pump back and forth. Sometimes the data pipeline. So there's some technologies that are being developed where they're talking about serializing your work, which means as you're doing it at that moment, it's being sent over the internet. So you're not saying, I worked for 15 hours, now I'm going to send 15 hours of work over the internet, and it's not going to be done before I have to start tomorrow morning. That's the issue right now is pumping that data. Um, so hopefully that will get fixed. And, uh, but that's the issue. And I know going from country to country, uh, that data flow is kind of an issue. So uh, I don't know. But I, I've heard of it, but I can't seem to find them. I've searched on the internet. I haven't, maybe my search for you is not working. Uh, one other question on... Um Ubuntu Studio, they've sunsetted that project, so it's still good for another three or four years. What happens after that? Well, that's one of the reasons I'm giving them props again, uh, because I started out with them for a while, and they kind of, the, the project, you know, it, 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 like any project, you need the people in community to drive it. It's one of the reasons I reinstalled it on this computer and used it for the presentation to give them props. I'd like to see within the next six months this year, and see if I can't gain some more traction bring in some new blood. There's a ton of people that work in Hollywood that have no idea what open source is. They're learning because they're learning because of Olympic and some of these others. So the question was uh, about Ubuntu Studio uh, being sunsetted and is the project still usable? Um, I think it is. It's still a great distro. Um, it's basically on the new LTS version of Ubuntu 16.04. So for a few years it's still good. I will tell you that I'm going to add it in there with Blender, Krita, and some of my other stuff, and I'm going to start promoting it again. See if I can get some traction. See if I can get some new blood developers here face-to-face -face with people in Hollywood to jump on. Because I think it's a fantastic project. Always has been. Love their IRC chat room. Great people. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's well worth people's time. This almost raises an idea for next year. So as you run into people and any of you run into people who might be interested in being maintainers for Ubuntu Studio, let's come here next year. Bring yourselves together. We'll have a talk about what's needed to maintain it and get attention for it and get some developers behind it and keep it going. Yeah, let's, let's do it because something focused, it's been tried repeatedly, but it keeps failing in the Linux distro ecosystem for some reason. But it just takes people organizing in the community. I think if we get enough people, especially if I can help anchor it here in Hollywood, I think I can get some traction because it's just a one-stop shop. And look what I'm doing. Now I'm showing this to Hollywood. They're going, you're doing what? Yeah, I'm taking Windows computers, putting in VBox, and I'm running Ubuntu flavors. So I think this solution is going to make sense to people. And, and musicians as well. I have two oh, friends yeah. who are musicians. One of them uses Ubuntu Studio for everything. The other uses it uh, in a shared workflow with a Mac. But um, that's just people I happen to know. Absolutely. So it, it's quite a capable system. If we get some yeah. more maintainers behind it, we can keep it running. Absolutely. Early on uh, in the comment was Ubuntu Studios used aggressively for audio. That's basically was always its core focus. But a few years ago, I came in and helped out with Blender and some of the video stuff. I hung out and chat with them. Gave them a, my two cents as much as I could. As a community member, like we're talking about, you know, I was vocal about what I think we needed. So they bumped up the video aspect of it, but I wasn't able to focus in with them and, and keep working and be a regular contributor to the community. But let's do it. That's a, you and I, you're here local too. You we'll, and I, let's do it. We'll and I, I, I'm going to, I put it on specifically to use for this presentation to give it props because I, I love the work that's already been done and I would love to see it go rather than being sunsetted. Any other questions? We have a couple okay. minutes left. Okay, I'm, I'm available so. too. Afterwards, stop me anytime. Talk to me if you got any specific needs, specific questions about what it takes to get involved with Hollywood. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you guys listening to me. And uh, as I like to say, good luck in your adventures. Thank Thanks you. Well, thanks again, JT. We have a 30-minute break, and then we come back here at 11:30, where Hi. Nathan Haynes will be discussing an overview of Ubuntu and how it's been navigating the changes over the last year and where it's headed next.
Okay, we're on. We have sound. Sound. We have sound. Um, before we introduce Nathan, yesterday we had a question about, uh, during uh, Jose's talk toward the end, there was a question about building out communities around hardware. Is that person here this morning? Okay, too bad. I discovered there's a boff tonight about that very topic. So um, what I've learned is take a look at the birds of a feather sessions in the schedule because there are a lot of specialty interests that are really kind of cool. So um, that's worth looking at. Another announcement worth knowing, some of you weren't here yesterday when I was plugging this, but it's really cool. Pasadena calls themselves the city of art and science. They pride themselves in a semi-annual event called Art Night. And most of the time, scale happens one week before art night. So everyone travels to Pasadena, and they don't get to have this wonderful time when the city opens up its best galleries and museums and performance spaces for free for the evening. Well, it happens to be tonight. So from 6 until 10, and there are venues within walking distance here, we have a lot of museums and galleries and performance spaces all free and welcoming you. So if you don't have other plans, you'll see these brochures in the brochure rack in the corner of this conference center. I put some on the table back here. And if you can't find one at all, at any time during the day, you can grab me and say, where do I learn more? Or you can just look up artnightpasadena.org. But it's pretty fab. -o. If I wasn't here going to Boffs, I'd be out enjoying the city's finest art. So worth knowing about. Oh, last preview thing today. Um, you know what today is. It's Friday. It's Friday, and at noon, something very special happens at scale. They open the expo floor. So we no longer fight that. We embrace that. We know that that's where you're going to want to be, and it's going to be a little longer than lunch. So we have a long break in our schedule for today. Two? Two. Sorry. Two o'clock that happens. Thank you. Um, so we have lunch after Nathan's talk, and then after lunch, continue, enjoy the time at the expo. Our next talk then is at, Nathan, is at 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock, I, I believe it is. It's on the schedule. You probably know it better than I do. We've been busy doing other things. but uh, So we have a long break. Just know that we have a long break. So enjoy that long break. Have a great lunch. Enjoy the expo floor. And then we'll all meet back here at 3 o'clock. But for now... We have Nathan Haynes. You're good to go? I think so. Okay. Um, Talking about the changing yep. face of Ubuntu. Yeah, the talk after the break not only is in the schedule, but also in guidebook, which is fantastic. Um, I see the projector is not working. And so... I, no, I don't. Okay. Exciting. I, I feel bad I pressed the button twice. Third time's the charm, maybe? the countdown. That looks ominous. <laughs> I hope good things happen in the future of Europe. I, I threatened to do this talk without slides, but it's <laughs> better with... All right. It's doing something. It says DJ. DJ. That is not mine. That's not me. Okay. Press the button again. Oh. Oh. As soon as I push the button. I'll try one more time. Oh, there we go. Nope. Are you on HDMI? I, I'm on HDMI, but I, it's like some, it says it's like a VGA horrible adapter thing. So, yep. That's from Scale. That should be uh, rotating through their web page when there is no one attached. Yes. Well. 
yes, when I when I press the button. All righty. There was a thing yesterday during Hanna's talk where I think some of the connectors are loose. There's there's like 15 adapters. Yeah. There's it's DGA really scary. To, yeah, display port to. <coughs> um. There's one small cable down here, and then it's just adapters all the way down. Got that. Wait, wait, wait. There you go. Oh. Gold okay. Button. So is that squished? I can't tell. It's, uh, it's it's right. I'm going to set it to what they asked for, and if it goes blank, then we know what the problem is. All right. So revert. Great. I know. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you for your patience, and thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, Ubuntu is my favorite operating system, and it has been for a very, very long time. And so one of the neat things about Ubuntu is that it's, it's always changing. It's always getting better and improving. And um, there's some really big improvements and changes in this uh, next cycle. So uh, you may have seen them in uh, October for Ubuntu 17.10. And you might find the LTS release and happy with 16.04 and wondering what's in store. Uh, in 18.04, you will have heard that the interface, everything changed, and you may be wondering why. And that's what I'm here to talk about, is the changing face of Ubuntu. Now, me, myself, my name is Nathan Haynes. I'm an author. You may know me from such books as Be uh, Beginning Ubuntu for Windows and Mac users. Thank you. Or such books as Beginning uh, Ubuntu for Windows and Mac users, second edition. <laughs> so, um, and so having started with 1404 and now 1604, and um, I don't know about 1804 yet. That's a publisher decision. Um, um, I was really there for the last bits dug in, and uh, now everything is different and changed, so I'm not looking forward to that if I have to rewrite my book for just uh, the interface, redo all the screenshots. Um, I'm an Ubuntu member, I'm the leader of the Ubuntu California Loco team, and I'm a computer enthusiast. So I've followed Linux for a very, very long time. Back when I was uh, doing dial-up BBSs and um, playing with DOS and my Windows i9 file for Windows 3.0, and I remember those old Linuxy things. And so um, what I want to talk about today is um, where Ubuntu's been and where it's going. Now, Ubuntu, like I said, has changed over the years. We're, we're at actually at the beginning of a big change right now. Ubuntu um, started off with GNOME 2, which is a very classic interface, and then in 2011 changed to Unity, which got bigger and better and more powerful and more streamlined. And um, so 1604 was really kind of the pinnacle of uh, Unity on the desktop. Um, when it came time to, uh, uh, so Ubuntu was about 11 and a half years old when 1604 came out. And with the release of um, 1704, that was the last release that shipped with Unity, um, a very beautiful release that was um, uh, not, not too bad now. Um, so uh, from that transition to Ubuntu being about 12 and a half years old to 1710, was the 13th anniversary of the Ubuntu release, and at 13 years old, um, everything changed. Things looked different. Uh, the textures on the login screen were a bit different. Um, everything was kind of familiar, but it was a little crankier, um, a little buggy because of the big transition, and suddenly um, strange new features were popping up in places where there weren't features before. And so for that 13th anniversary birthday of Ubuntu, um, things have really changed. And so, um, we see that 17 was a very, very, very big change. So I want to talk about um, where Ubuntu began and how, how Ubuntu started, what the purpose of the project was, and how those changes have sort of um, uh, come about, because it's, I think it's a sort of an interesting story. In the beginning, it was not Ubuntu. Now, uh, the world of uh, Unix really stretches back to about 1968 or 9, and I'm not going to go back that far. Um, 
Linux started in September 91. I'm not going to go back quite that far, although if we look back um, there, we have a really cool uh, Unix-like kernel for the 386. Um, at the time, a lot of people who were working on, at, uh, on computers at universities were using uh, some sort of Unix-like OS uh, on a VAX or a PDP or uh, something similar. And um, if you're programming um, and you're working on computers, you want something very, very similar. At the time, uh, we did a BSD, uh, which for various licensing reasons, it wasn't quite sure if you could redistribute it. And so um, when Linus Torvalds, um, a university uh, student at the University of uh, Helsinki in Finland, said, I'm going to write my own kernel, and just for fun, it'll never be anything really big, but I, wanted, I just want to do it. And um, meanwhile, the new project uh, had been trying to re-implement Unix um, from the user space out and working inwards towards the kernel, still working on that kernel. Um, uh, the, everything came into place at the right time, and so we had this really great ecosystem where we had this free software user space. We had suddenly, from nowhere, this uh, Unix-like kernel. Um, the free software guys jumped in and said, you know what's the best license ever is the GPL. Linus Tolvat says, I just, I don't really care. I just want people to be able to share it and use it and prove it if it's useful for them, because that's what I'm doing. Um, and boom, suddenly we had Linux. Now, Linux back then was literally, you had FTP sites with source code with all the utilities, and you had the Linux kernel that you could go and compile. And so to be useful, um, uh, Linux wasn't useful, it was just a kernel, you had to get everything else. And so different groups, because everything was free to redistribute, were able to take this, and so we have this uh, soft landing um, system, which was the first Linux distro. Uh, Slackware showed up uh, very, very uh, soon thereafter. Debian showed up uh, about three months later, and I think 92, I want to say. And so um, Debian came around and said, we want to be a completely free operating system, and we want to uh, have lots of uh, utilities and be very, very useful. Now, uh, so between these different distros, um, Slackware and Debian and Red Hat kind of uh, came about as well around the same time. We were able to, you were able to actually go in and get a bunch of files and burn them to a disk and boot off of it, make a boot floppy. And um, for as little or for as few as eight floppies, boot floppy, root floppy, and then package floppies, you too could have a Linux system at home on your IBM PC. So it was a really, really cool thing. And you'd, uh, you'd boot from it, you'd, you'd switch back and forth, um, you hit enter to unmap the floppy, or you get a kernel panic uh, in the good old days. And um, you'd have an installation screen, and you'd have a, a categories, um, accessories, communications, uh, engineering, science, math, documentation, uh, uh, programming, compilers, text editors, graphics, games. And you'd go through, and you'd have maybe, depending on the, on the release, you'd have maybe anywhere from um, 200 to 2,000 to maybe 5,000 packages that you could, during install, you'd be prompted to pick the packages you wanted to install to have a working system. Um, if you had a good default selection, it was up to you to um, not uncheck things that you needed to install, like drivers and the kernel and X and bash. So, um, or TC shell or, or whatever else you were using at the time. Um, as free software gained momentum and Linux became more popular, this grew and grew, and suddenly we had CD-ROMs. Um, I remember when I got back into Linux after the old, old, old days, like the first, my first experience with Linux was a dial-up shell as a BBS. And when I wanted to do it myself, a uh, friend's dad was an engineer, uh, and so he gave me a five CD collection. And I, my first experience with, uh, with installing locally was Debian 1.0. And if you check Wikipedia, there is no Debian 1.0 because Infomagic took Debian 0.93 release uh, 6 between the uh, 8 out to ELF transition where the way binaries were compiled was completely different. Threw that on the CD and said Debian 1.0 and it didn't work. And I said, well, Debian's not so good. I'll maybe use Slack or Red Hat. Um, and uh, um, Debian was fine, just uh, it, it, that was not what we got. So um, the first Debian release is 1.1, um, but that was still a 5 CD set full of different, different software. And when I got back into 2003, uh, SUSE 9.0 was like four or five CDs. And you download all the CDs and you boot, you get a nice, uh, easy text uh, uh, installer or graphical installer, depending on the distro. And you can then choose from like 3,000 installs 
um, any of your favorite of 50 different text editors and so on. And so, uh, and then you would, and then would have you swap out disks, and you wouldn't use every disk. You would have to download all the disks because you didn't know what packages you, packages you had and what disks they were on. So back in the days, you'd spend um, maybe a day and a half downloading like five, six, seven CDs, and then um, you'd use like two of them, maybe like the last one, and then your because the printer drivers like on Windows was always like on last disk. And so things were really complex. You could have any system you want, you wanted, but uh, if you were an engineer, programmer, and a had a lot of Unix experience, you could have the perfect system. But if you were like me and you were just getting started, you could wind your way through, but it was kind of really tricky. It was kind of really scary. So things changed. In 2004, a Debian developer named Mark Shuttleworth said, you know, I'm going to, um, I think we can do better. Free software is the future. He, he had uh, built his own company named Thought um, out of free software because <coughs> he came from humble beginnings. Made it really big. Was one of the first, uh, when you go to websites and they have SSL certificates, uh, that's what Thought did um, just back before VeriSign. Sold to VeriSign, made a ton of money, um, traveled up to the space station um, on his own dime and was on the Mir for a week uh, doing cool Japanese space agency experiments and probably drinking vodka. Uh, Americans, you can't, Americans don't drink in space. It's completely wrong and horrible because alcohol's bad. Um, the Russians hide vodka. They, they, they get sent out with their shipments, so <laughs> they don't drink constantly, but you know, you're off your shift. It's a holiday. You know, I'm sure New Year's is a blast on the Russian module. So he went up and he did that, and so he gave back and says, well, how can I give back? Free software gave me all this. I, I, I want to do philanthropy. So he said, let's Really take free software, and let's just um, uh, let's showcase it. It can be bigger and better. And so the idea of um, I described Linux for engineers was really, really great and really cool and fun to play with because I loved DOS and all those codes and had the time because I was 15, 16 to play with it. But he had the idea of Linux for human beings. And so the concept was let's take uh, let's get everything together and let's have one CD that you can download. Let's make sure it fits in a no more than a 650 megabyte disk, because the 700 megs were um, not rare anymore, but still more expensive. And let's get one disk that you put in and you, ins you install, and it installs in 30 minutes. It doesn't even ask you any questions. Um, you get um, one best-of-class desktop environment. You get one good office suite, one good web browser, one good instant messenger, and you just have everything there. And so Ubuntu 4.10 looked like this. It was very simple, very brown, very GNOME 2. And um, it wasn't so bad, actually. Uh, uh, I remember hearing the release on Slashdot, and I was thinking, um, uh, it was, oh, so of course this is based on uh, Debian. Let's take Debian every six months. Um, Debian's going in between two and three years every release. The, the uh, stable version had all added aid software. He said, let's take Debian and stable, and every six months we're going to freeze it, polish it, knock all the bugs, just pick specific software that we can really showcase and make really better, contribute upstream, and we're going to showcase this. Now, when this first was released, I, heard on, I read on Slashdot, which is what I read uh, at the time. Now it's Reddit, but Slashdot. And I said, oh, um, I read the article. I said, some self-made millionaire is making himself a vanity distro, and it's going to be uh, all around community. I'm like, community? Uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I'll, I'll pass. Um, six months later, when... Um, when uh, uh, 504 uh, came out, there was a uh, the new release was coming on Slashdot. There was a ton of buzz, and I said, "Well, if it's free. Uh, there wouldn't still be buzz if there wasn't something to this." So I said, "I'm going to try it out," and I did, and it was amazing because everything just worked. Um, and I didn't have like five text editors and like three versions of Solitaire, and you know everything. So I'm like, oh, "This is pretty cool, actually." And of course, um, I at that time I could go in and install everything and start tweaking text files and changing, um, should have the XKCD in here, like changing uh, X386 config at the time. Um, but I don't, I never really wanted to do those things. I just wanted to get to work. So um, I had a PDF viewer, everything installed. So it was, it was really, 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 really great. And on the community side, um, at the time, uh, it's hard to remember a time now when, w when you went to a Linux forum and every, they still exist today, but every single forum, you go in and you're a beginner and you don't know where to begin because everything's, you thought Windows works with computers, and no surprise, uh, Unix stretches back to the 50s in heritage. 
um, the 70s and actuality and um, it does everything completely different because Windows had, was, didn't exist and VMS didn't exist um, and so on. Uh, uh, so, and CPM didn't exist. That's where Windows gets its inspiration. So do you go online and you get asked a form and say, well, uh, I have some questions and they'd say, you know, they call you noob. You'd say, they wouldn't even bother to type it out. They'd say RTFM. If anyone remembers what that stands for, for those of you who don't, it means read the fine manual. And, <laughs> and the world was a different place back then. Um, you were expected to um, start looking through source code to find your answers before you went, to, um, uh, went online. And it's reasonable to expect to do some work before you went online, but they were, there was no forgiveness at all whatsoever. Um, so if the Ubuntu project was founded. Now, Ubuntu is an ancient African, African philosophy um, uh, of humanity towards others. Um, so what it means is um, that if, uh, you know, we're all, we're all human, we're all in one community, and if I help you, um, I don't just lift you up, but I lift our whole community and lift myself up as well, which is the best, most succinct definition of free software I think I've ever heard. So when I realized that um, um, this wasn't just a line, that they really actually did uh, expect people to be kind and polite, and they, they lived by this philosophy on the Ubuntu forums. There was a code of conduct. I said, you know, this is something I want to be associated with. The software is wonderful. The people are great. I Google a problem, put Ubuntu at the end. I get the answer. I said, this is, this is great. Ubuntu got better and browner. Uh, this here is Ubuntu 606. Um, after a couple releases, we said, you know, everything's going great. We, we haven't missed any deadlines. Um, we have really good first-class desktop use. It's getting really popular. Let's, um, no one can use it on, on servers or in business because it's every six months. Let's take a release and let's, let's sit down and focus on making it really super stable. Um, and let's support it instead of just for 18 months, which is a year and a half. Um, let's, let's support it for longer. Let's, let's go with three years. So you can install it on a, on a server and um, uh, not incur the wrath of IT. Um, and so we spent about six extra, six or eight extra weeks working on uh, Ubuntu 604. And because the date slipped from April to, uh, to June, it uh, became Ubuntu 606 LTS. And this was the first uh, version. Now, by this time, we see that um, things are a little more shiny at the time. Uh, glossy, shiny textures were the big thing. So the title bar is a little shinier, it's a little browner. Um, it's a little more Ubuntu-y. And we have two years later, 804. We, on time, did our second LTS. And this is where Ubuntu um, really started, classic Ubuntu really started to take shape and, and got a lot of, uh, of buy-in. I think uh, we we're starting to uh, look at cloud technologies like Eucalyptus, um, which was sort of a cool thing. And, um, and um, now it's all open stack, but we got in on that too um, in an extra release or two. And of course, use Compiz. So if you took that window and you took your mouse and shook it, the window would wobble like, a, like it was made of jelly, um, which is fun. But if you took two windows um, and moved them side by side um, to line them up, they'd stick, um, you know, so they didn't overlap for a little bit, but they would squish a little bit. So you get a little bit of feedback when you did that. Um, I miss, I don't miss the spinning desktop cube, which was awesome, but I never really used. I do miss wobbly windows. Now, Ubuntu at this time had really made a name for itself and it got more popular. And so what happened was that um, we had had this really brown look, this really that harkened back to uh, Africa and the desert. Now humans all come, every human here, if you trace back, came out of Africa. Um, maybe several times actually, it's really complex, but we all came from one place, we're all shared humanity, uh, free software is a shared community. And so that was a really great way to focus on. As Ubuntu came into a more professional type of uh, look, it was decided that Mark Schoedler said, it's time to rebrand and leave the brown behind a little bit and the tans and the rich uh, deep browns and the oranges. And let's go with a brand new look. And so Ubuntu had a new look, a new sleek look <coughs> that really focused on lightness and uh, dependability and reliability. And um, so Ubuntu went from, from brown to purple and orange, mostly orange. And so we got a new look that was slightly refined, but we had a brand new look on the desktop. Um, and that was the beginning of um, some major changes. Now Ubuntu by itself uh, was still going super strong. 
At the same time, GNOME 2, that Ubuntu was built on, GNOME 2 is a fantastic desktop environment that survives today in uh, Mate, and I forget the other uh, fork that is also excellent. I think I want to see Budgie, maybe. Um, I knew this when I got up here, but anyway. Um, uh, at the same time, GNOME was starting to look at its vision for the future, and it had some very strong ideas uh, as to how it wanted that future uh, of computing to look and how to sort of revolutionize things. And Ubuntu and Canonical also had some really strong ideas on how they wanted computing to work, and they wanted to change things and make things faster and more connected. Now, as it turned out, at the time, GNOME um, has always had strong opinions, and Ubuntu is founded. Let's take Debian and make some very strong opinions um, so that you have... Um, um, we had to ship VI as a text editor, for example, because um, if you don't, um, then... Uh, you get your Linux license taken away. Um, and, uh, of course, it shipped with Nano, which is the best text editor uh, ever. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you. Nano is the new ed, if you ask me. Who here, uh, who here uses VI? And so keep your hand up if you, it's because you tried it and you, uh, years ago and you still can't figure out how to quit. <laughs> yeah. VI has two modes, beep repeatedly, break everything. Um, Emacs, of course, wasn't shipped with it because it's giant and huge. Emacs stands for Escape Meta Alt Control Shift. Um, um, but their philosophy was we'd make one good choice, VIs and everything, Nano's good for beginners, we'll ship that. Um, but if you want Emacs, you can go get it. Super easy, one command, it's, you have it, you make your best, best system. And so Ubuntu was founded on strong choices. And GNOME also had strong choices. The problem is, is um, Ubuntu said, you know, we've been, we've been lost up, we're shipping the newest version of GNOME, GNOME comes out in March, and we come out in April, so uh, we're always in lockstep. up. Let's work together and make something really cool. Uh, you have GNOME shells, has some interesting ideas, we have some good ideas to make it more user-friendly and a little more powerful, and GNOME, well, in my unbiased opinion, let me just say GNOME uh, decided that they had a strong opinion and didn't want to bother with collaboration and working. They wanted to get their own ideas out and focus on that, which is valid. Um, but they weren't too friendly to uh, ideas for enhancements and so on. And so their vision uh, was different than what Ubuntu wanted. And so Ubuntu decided that they needed to uh, go ahead and, and take their vision because GNOME 3 wasn't looking so good at the very beginning uh, not as far as user friendliness goes. So in 2010, we had a brand new feel. And uh, as netbooks started becoming the big new thing, and screen sizes got smaller, and we had more and more connectivity and so on, it was decided that we needed a brand new look. And so, um, so in uh, Ubuntu 1104, uh, Unity was released. Now in uh, 1010, if no one remembers uh, the netbook remix, but uh, there was a very simplified sort of early proto Unity that was just perfect for really uh, tiny little screens uh, on netbooks and that simplified things and so we took that and applied to the desktop. Now, the good news is that um, over the years this got bigger and better. Um, the bad news is 11.04 was a little rough. It worked out. You could work around the, um, learn how things worked and work around the changes. It wasn't that bad. Um, the better news was that 11.10 was really good and 12.04 the focus was to say let's make this really polished, really good for power users. Um, but this was the new look of Ubuntu, the launcher on the left to uh, reduce space, um, one top panel uh, at the top. If you maximize a window, uh, the, the title bar disappears into the top panel so you're not wasting space. Uh, rather than um, playing a game of uh, what happens when I click this uh, notification icon, this tray icon, um, if I click or right click, do I, do I get a menu? Do I activate a feature? Do I open a window? Do I close a window? Do I run a program? Do I, you know, make a, uh, a change? Rather, uh, we had these great menus that um, had a networking menu that gave you your network status, your uh, sound menu that gave you uh, volume sliders for your uh, speakers, your mic if you were recording, um, uh, play and pause and status of your uh, rhythm box or VLC players, um, everything all in one place. And so that did get refined. This is 1204. This is the first LTS. Got refined. It's a little prettier, a little sleeker. And the other thing Unity really did very, very well. Um, 
This was the first standalone where they said, we're going to make this a power user interface where you can do everything from the keyboard. And so sure enough, there was a great feature called HUD, uh, where if you're in LibreOffice or GIMP or some other uh, 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 program with really powerful, complex, arcane menus, um, if you're a power user, you probably know if you tap the uh, Alt key, you get a little, you highlight the menus, you can use arrow keys to move, or Alt F goes to file, Alt E goes to edit, and so on. If you just tap Alt, you get a search bar um, then, and you can just type in what you wanted to do, and it filters through and searches the menu options and shows you them along with the bre breadcrumb trail to where it was. So one, um, you can just tell the computer what you want to do, and two, if you actually did need to find that in the menus later, it already taught you how to do that. You could go through and pick the one and run it right from there. Best thing ever. In 1210, um, the uh, idea was, was made to have web integration. And so, um, for example, if you went to Gmail or uh, Google Play or Amazon Music, you could go in. And um, so the nice thing about the launchers is you, had, you could see what was open. And the cool thing about the launchers here is that if you had like new email, for example, you'd have like an icon and you'd have like a little badge number when new emails or new messages came in. You'd have progress bars. Um, and so the idea was, uh, was uh, made to let's bring web pages and let's have a Firefox extension. If you go to Yahoo Mail and a mail comes in, you get a notification on the screen and you get a little uh, icon there. You, uh, Yahoo Mail will be a separate icon in the launcher. If you click it, it switches to your browser and the right tab. If you're listening to music, um, you can actually play and pause and do, do the next track in Spotify, Pandora, and so on from the sound menu. And that was a beautiful, beautiful feature that only was around for about a year because unfortunately um, it didn't catch buy-in. Um, Ubuntu was a little too early and uh, the uh, W3C had some ideas for web integration that weren't quite compatible and uh, also nobody, nobody adopted those changes themselves, which I thought was a really, really good change. Um, but as we got closer and closer to this idea of accessing information from everywhere, um, the idea became that Ubuntu could be a single platform for many, many different devices. Already Ubuntu through Unity could bring in, if you had uh, lots of programs running, you had um, lots of features through Sad Menu and so on, where you could in one place in your shell uh, control all of them. Like I said, it works perfect for music and so on. Um, through the Unity launcher, you could also search online. So for example, if I searched um, music, I could search not only my library, but the Amazon uh, MP3 music store. I could search um, uh, you know, my audio tracks on, uh, some, uh, I don't remember the service anymore, I think Google Play was one of them. Um, you, could actually, you could actually search for music online, get listings, and you could preview the music. So if you saw, if you didn't have an album, if you did have an album, you could go through and hit play, and, preview the tracks. If you didn't, but it was on Amazon, you could actually, you could actually take a look and see, and you could, you could actually hit play right there in your shell. Uh, and, and if you liked it, you could click buy, you go to the web page, and you could buy it there. Um, Ubuntu launched its own uh, web service called Ubuntu One that had file syncing as well, as well as a music store, and it did the exact same thing. So, um, so the evolution of this was, let's, have, let's make Ubuntu a platform where you can write a program once, use these services once, and it can run on any device. And that was really, really, really cool. So what we have here in 1604 is the last version of Unity where it was really, really powerful. And we had this ability to, uh, about 1504 actually, about a year before, where we could have a phone. And we could have different programs. We had a really nice Unity dash that because of the phone, gave you your weather right there. It gave you all your applications. You could you could run um, uh, you could you know sort of play music um, through edge swipes. You could pull up the launcher just like you had in Ubuntu. Um, you could go through your task list. And we went um, we developed Unity for the phones and kind of worked backwards and sort of um, let's let's work back. We are we know the perfect desktop is Unity, so let's make sure everything works really great on phones and tablets and work backwards. And so while work on that never finished, um, it was, we could take these exact same programs, if you look on the right there, uh, uh, the Dash, Music, Web Browser, and, and a, a Terminal, and on a tablet you could turn on uh, stage, uh, or turn on uh, uh, computer mode, 
And you could, get the you could switch and get the exact same thing in Windows that were movable. This is on the Nexus 7, but it looked the exact same thing on a as on a computer. These same programs um, automatically adapted to the form factor you're using. So you could have a phone, and you could be on there, and you could get your information. And then when you got to the hotel room, you get scale, you go up to the hotel room, you don't need to bring your laptop. You go up to your hotel room, you get your HDMI adapter, plug it into the TV, and it automatically adapts to this. It was there, it existed, it was a great idea, it was working. Um, and unfortunately, after several years of working on this, um, there was just no industry buy-in. We had several, uh, we did have uh, BQ in Spain and Meizu in China that had actually shipped devices and were working. Um, cells were iffy, the software wasn't quite there. Uh, you could really see, see where it was going. And if you, ha we had them here at scale, if you've been here, you've seen the devices. Um, People read them on the about on the web and say, that sounds really weird, I don't understand. And then they get to the booth and say, so I heard about this thing, and it was really weird, I don't understand. And I say, well, here's a tablet, try it. And the moment someone swiped in from the left edge and saw the launcher, swiped in, saw the apps, clicked, we go to, we switched to desktop mode and everything came up, uh, the, uh, the light bulb turned on. Uh, touching was believing, it was really great. Unfortunately, after several years, it didn't catch on. And so it didn't make sense anymore to focus on this because the, de the, the traditional desktop was kind of stagnating. And um, this vision of sort of uh, was really, really expensive and didn't catch on. And so unfortunately, uh, just uh, before Ubuntu 1704 was launched, it was announced uh, last, about a year ago that Unity uh, was canceled and was no longer going to be the future of Ubuntu. And so, um, a lot of people were really happy. A lot of people were, were really sad. And so the future of Ubuntu then was in question because Unity had defined what Ubuntu was for six long years. And so we know that Unity was built on, Ubuntu has always been built on Debian, always been built on GNOME. And even when we used Unity, um, we still used GNOME. Um, just we just didn't use GNOME shell. We put a Unity in as a shell, and we worked on that. Uh, but we still used all the great GNOME apps like uh, Minds and Solitaire and Calculator and the settings and the software settings. So it's all, all you know, we've always been close to GNOME, um, but not interface-wise. So the answer was obviously return to GNOME. But GNOME looks like this. And so as pretty and clean as that is, um, that does, it's not very Ubuntu-y. Um, for one thing, everything is giant. Um, two, the launcher is gone. So if you go from, now any of you here who are an expert uh, who use VI but put your hand down when I said who, who couldn't figure out how to quit, you can figure everything out for yourself and customize it. And you probably already know the 20 extensions you need to make GNOME shell usable um, for you on your computer. But if we go from 1604, um, to, to this, surprise, 1804 uh, update in July and you get this, a lot of people are going to be really upset because nothing works the same way, everything's uh, completely different, um, they're going to be lost. So um, while the idea was to go back to GNOME, it was clear that we needed to do something else. And so um, what happened was after the transition was announced, Canonical sent some employees to Guadec, uh, which is a GNOME con conference, and they were sitting around and saying, you know, we really want to just make some just slight customizations. Um, GNOME has, GNOME really expects the distro to do a lot of customization and uh, GNOME sort of hard codes a lot of things. So for example, if a distro has, if a session has a default uh, plugin, um, you can never ever disable that plugin ever. It's just not possible. GNOME doesn't allow it. Um, so uh, the question was, well, if we, if we ship a plugin, um, it can't be disabled, and all plugins, uh, GNOME automatically updates the plugins, so we can't, we can't ensure uh, that our uh, software cycle is respected and we can't support things. What do we do? So uh, a couple bold decisions were made. And so um, at Guadec, um, I think Olivier Tiloy was, uh, and uh, someone else, I can't remember, Ken Van Dyne, were talking to some GNOME people, and they said, you know, we just want to make some changes. We want to have them separate so that we can kind of put all our changes here. So we're not changing everything to GNOME, but we're, we, have, we have a way to customize. And I said, well, we have this feature called session support. Why don't you use that? And I said, ah, tell me more. So sessions in GNOME is a way that you can um, sort of ship with a, a, a profile that uh, then 
sort of um, uh, it has some defaults, um, but you can you can have different sessions and different profiles. So if you look at 1710 right now, actually, is this 1710? This is actually Bionic. This is 1804 as of yesterday. Um, this is what it looks like now. And this is what really 1710 looks like. Um, so this is a default. If you upgrade uh, to the newest version of Ubuntu, it's going to look like this. Now, you'll notice it looks a lot like Unity. It's very familiar. Um, we didn't bother to re-implement Unity, um, so there's no big friendly button. Um, the panels, uh, the indicators are mostly gone. Um, time's in the center. Um, but we put the icons back to a human size, which is, I think, very nice. We have a launcher on the left. And while it doesn't do a lot of the things that uh, Unity did, um, it is that still, still, still same familiar look. And so uh, rather than go and do our own extensions, there was already a fantastic extension called Dash uh, for GNOME, a plugin called Dash to Doc. It was a fantastic plugin, and it did pretty much what we wanted. It did more than what we wanted, actually. Um, so we said, well, let's maybe we don't want to support this forever and all these changes, um, but we need to support what we ship. So let's maybe talk to Dash to Doc and see what they say about um, well, what if we sort of um, uh, fork the plugin so it gets a different um, a, a different uh, fingerprint uh, ID so it's not constantly so when Dash to Doc can do their own thing and we're not Ubuntu users aren't getting updated without a warning or a recourse, and let's maybe reduce some of the features, make it very very simple change the defaults, ship with something, you know, friendly, um, and then maybe think about how we can work with Dash to Doc. So uh, the Dash to Doc developers were like, this is a great idea, let's work together. And so um, a fork was made, it's in the Dash to Doc, uh, the Ubuntu doc is um, in the GitHub repository for Dash to Doc. It's a subset, it doesn't have all the features. Um, any specific features we added specifically for Ubuntu, um, has a different namespace. And so what happens is that um, when you make changes to, um, to to the Ubuntu doc, and you say, you know, I've been using Ubuntu now for a couple of months, and now I'm an expert, and I just want more, and I want Dash to doc, you can go and, and install Dash to doc. Ubuntu doc cannot be disabled. GNOME does not allow it. It's impossible. So when Ubuntu doc detects that you've installed Dash to doc and it's active, the Ubuntu doc automatically hides itself, so it gets out of the way. Any settings you've changed that are common um, are reflected in Dash to Doc because they're the same thing. And when you go in and you change like the launcher size or, or other uh, more advanced Dash to Doc settings that we don't necessarily support, if you uninstall Dash to Doc and you, so Ubuntu Doc pops up automatically, so you, you, so you're never left without a way to like, n without a way to, to launch programs. All those same features, um, we don't support them, we don't expose them, but um, Ubuntu Doc respects those features. So you can move back and forth, try it out, and, 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 and it's this really great uh, symbiosis. And in fact, when I, in uh, uh, Canonical was kind enough to send me to uh, New York in uh, end of September to work, we, just before 1710 came out, we were already thinking about 1804. And the first thing I did was find, um, I'm not a GNOME Shell fan, so I'm still on, I was still on Unity, and I installed, a, got new, swapped out my hard drive, installed it, played with it for a couple weeks, flew there, and immediately found a bug in the dock. So I said, great, file a bug here in Launchpad, file a bug upstream. I hate filing bugs because it's hard work to file a good bug, but I only file good bugs. Um, Ten minutes later, upstream said, uh, one of the de uh, developers said, oh, hey, uh, uh, that's odd. Yeah, you're right, that shouldn't be that. Hold on. And 45 minutes after that, um, said, yeah, I fixed the problem. This was the problem, this is the, the patch. There's a pull request against, uh, it was fixed upstream, and there's a pull request uh, in uh, our fork against our, our fork. So um, there's a really lovely uh, upstream relationship where we're working really hard so that um, we have a really good experience, but you can also customize it to your heart's content. Um, at the same time, uh, you can definitely, uh, so say, say you love GNOME, GNOME shell, and you want to run Ubuntu for all the other reasons, um, the support, lifetime, uh, and so on. Um, you can take Ubuntu 710, or 1710 or 1804, open, open up a terminal, type apt install GNOME dash session, and you get this. You get, uh, well, you log out, you go to your username, you click on the gear icon, you pick GNOME, and you get this. You get, uh, minus the wallpaper, you get, um, 
you get vanilla GNOME. So we have a really great uh, transitional interface for GNOME Shell that we're continuing to improve and iterate on, and, and we'll do so more in the future. But if you go from 1604 to 1804, users are going to, it's going to be different, but familiar and easy to, 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 to learn. And if you really want a GNOME, um, you get it. In fact, if you were running Ubuntu GNOME 1604 and you upgrade, this is what you get by, the, by default. So we worked really hard to, um, to, to uh, work with GNOME. And in fact, um, GNOME back in 2010, when we were thinking about Unity and the new the face of uh, the desktop, was very hostile um, towards uh, external ideas and contribution. That's since changed. Now, I didn't know this because I said, well, uh, I'm not a UI developer doing other stuff. But meanwhile, a GNOME has changed. So when we went back and said, we're going to go back to GNOME, we want to work together, how do we, how do we make our changes, uh, maybe have, give you improvements, how do we work together? GNOME said, that's great, we want to work together. And so um, if you are used to the acrimony between uh, the GNOME project and Ubuntu, um, it's not there anymore. Um, while sort of feelings always linger a little bit here and there, uh, the GNOME project has been incredible. And so, for example, we used session support to enable you to have either our great defaults or um, GNOME's defaults. And um, so we said, well, great. How do we make this even bigger and better so it's stronger and every distro can use sessions? and ship default vanilla GNOME with very little changes, but have their own customization. GNOME said, great, let's, let's talk about that. We're talking about indicators, we're talking about uh, ways to share technology so that, um, and, and help improvements. So when Ubuntu says, well, we need this, and we're gonna do this own thing, we say, how can we implement this in a way that's not gonna interfere with your plans? And so that relationship is new, but very encouraging, very strong, and is still continuing today. So the present today is we have GNOME, we have GNOME Shell, we have a really nice way. Oh, if you want Unity, by the way, if you've upgraded, uh, you'll get that GNOME Shell uh, inter interface on the login prompt. You click your name, you click the gear icon, you can pick Unity and you can go back to it. Or just like I said, you can say apt install GNOME session and get perfect GNOME, vanilla GNOME. You can do apt install Unity session and it will pull in Unity. So that's still going to stick around for those of you who still want it, um, like myself. Uh, it's not going anywhere as long as it's kind of minimally maintained. Canonical will still keep it working with the XOR drivers um, and so forth. So we're working really hard on a really solid, stable desktop. Now, the thing about LTSs and, 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 and software these days is that you have um, lots of great applications, and the Ubuntu guarantee of stability is that we're going to ship applications, we're going to maintain them, you're going to get bug fixes, you're going to get security updates for up to five years on the desktop. Remember 606, I just said three years, um, it was five years on the server, three years on the desktop, now it's five years for everyone. Um, so if you really love Unity in 1604, you can keep using that until 2021. Uh, Unity is also still in 1804 and then you can use that until 2023. So there's Lots of options. The problem is, is that we have these, all these great applications. LibreOffice is the best Office suite out there for general purposes. Uh, VLC, for example, isn't shipped by default, but it's like the best media player out there. Um, I, I love Calibre to manage my ebook collection. I'm an author, as I said, and a writer. Um, and so uh, I use that for my Kindle, but it's an older version. And so we, uh, the question is, how do we, um, you don't want to have, a, you know, 5,000 desktops deployed across your enterprise and wake up one day and now you have LibreOffice 17 and also it's an, saving a new file format and it doesn't read any of the other file formats. It's all, it changes all the fonts to wingdings. You don't want to wake up and deal with that. So that's our guarantee you get the same software. But sometimes you want that new software. If you, you can use 1604, um, like I said, till 2021. That's a long, long time. It's three more years. Um, but you may, but LibreOffice 6.0 is out. And so um, you're still stuck on LibreOffice 5.3, I believe it is, um, in, in 1604. So the question is, how do we deal with having a really solid base? We have, we have great relationships upstream. Um, things are better than ever. Um, how do we keep these applications? If, people, if you're gonna use Ubuntu and rely on it for a long, long time, how do you keep applications fresh? Because remember, the goal of an operating system isn't to use the operating system. It's to have a platform to run other programs and get out of your way so you can interact with those applications. So those need to be there as well. The answer came out of the phone. Um, 
when you have a phone, you can't install things and have broken dependencies and then like, everything's broken and you just reflash your phone. That doesn't work. And so while we didn't stick with the phone, we worked really hard to, uh, to have technology that was reliable and um, super, super, super um, uh, dependable. And the answer uh, grew out of the phone. Um, we had click packages to the phone. We kind of made a super click package. Click 2.0 was called Snaps. We knew we could run on embedded devices, which again, can't be upgraded, can't have dependency problems, can't have failed installs, and can't be reflashed if you have like 15 of them out, you know, across the state or the country. Um, so Snaps are a way to develop things. Now the cool thing about Snaps um, is that it's made of different modules. And so um, uh, Ubuntu 16.4 ships with Snap support. 18.4 is even bigger and better on the desktop. Uh, with a snap, you have a core snap uh, that is downloaded and installed, and it's even to 16.04. It's the tiniest it's little uh, uh, seed system drivers and, and, and libraries and so on, rather, libraries. And then when you have a program, it's compiled for 16.04, and because that program runs against that core snap, that program that you've compiled for 16.04 and you've released now runs on any platform that supports snaps. So that one program, Run. So if you, if you take a program and compile it and then copy the files over to different Linux distributions, it'll break unless all the stars align, the plants align, and all, every library version is exactly different. Because we have a core snap as part of the, the uh, snap experience, that one program uh, runs against um, Ubuntu 14.04, Ubuntu 16.04, uh, uh, 17.10, uh, right in RIM as well, but um, they're not supported. So 14.04, 6.04, 7.10, 1804 without modification. It also runs uh, on Arch, OpenSUSE, Fedora. Uh, we're working on Debian. Um, that same program runs basically everywhere, everywhere that supports snaps. And so for, uh, for free software, you can always recompile it. You have the source code. Um, but it's a lot of work and a lot of, um, if you've never packaged software for a distro, for Debian and for Ubuntu and Fedora and for you know RPMs and everything, good because it's really hard and they're all different and it's a lot of work and you got to test them all. With a snap you do it once it works everywhere. So not only is it easier uh, for uh, smaller uh, developers but also for proprietary software where you don't have uh, source code and where the vendor doesn't want to support 20 different Linux uh, platforms, snaps provide one single platform. And so with snaps software can come directly from the developer and what that means is that instead of waiting for it to hit the Debian repository, get pulled into Ubuntu, then it gets polished, and then so some uh, six to nine months down the road, it shows up in Ubuntu. Um, that program can show up right away. It gets pushed, the, the developer compiles it, tests it real quick, pushes it to the store, um, promotes it to the stable channel, and your computer's checking three times a day to make sure that um, it finds a new version. It updates automatically. The updates are atomic. Uh, when you install a Debian package, every single program you've ever installed on Ubuntu through a Debian package, through Ubuntu software, however, however it may be, um, double clicking on it, you put in your, uh, your uh, uh, password and you give that package root access to your computer because uh, there's an install script that takes your files, sprays them all over your file system, puts them in user bin and puts them in uh, user shared and Etsy and so on. Um, every single program is decompressed, takes up more room, you've got the original archive, you've got all the decompressed stuff, you've given the package maintainer root access to your computer. Now the way a snap works, it's one file, it's the squashfs file, it's compressed, it's downloaded. To install, it's mounted in place. So it's still compressed, it doesn't take up any extra room than the download, and it, does n it never gets root access, um, and plus, uh, ap applications are actually sandboxed so that they can't go off. Um, the program itself sees, if it looks in root, it sees that core snap, not your actual system. Uh, many programs to be useful have access to your home directory. That's a, a plug that can, um, uh, that can be changed, like on a cell phone. You can give access to networking or home or so on. And in 1804, there's going to be ways to, um, to really, um, a couple, couple plugs are a couple uh, access to things are granted automatically if they're requested. Um, some programs need extra things. And so software, Ubuntu software is going to give you an option uh, when you install it. Uh, here's some additional things it can have access to. And you get to decide whether or not you want to grant it access. You get that cell phone security on your desktop with a program that can always be the freshest software from the developer and, um, and you can control the access. So snaps can be, uh, 
confined to enhanced security. Uh, Skype, for example, is not confined uh, for esoteric reasons. It almost works confined, not quite. Uh, Microsoft's working on it. Canonical's working on it. Um, but a lot of programs are, are confined, so um, they're really safe when you're getting software from uh, third-party developers. Most of them are trustworthy, um, but all it takes is, uh, is our credentials to be compromised, and someone else can swoop in and compromise that PPA uh, or that software project. And so um, with SNAPS, you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the the uh, uh, vulnerability surface is far, 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 far less. And SNAPS run on like a different version of Ubuntu. So Ubuntu's always had this goal to be a complete solution for the computer, to always be up to date, to be entirely uh, existing of free and open source software other than drivers where like, you don't have a choice. And so as we move from Unity, and as we go to GNOME Shell and we rejoin that community, I made a joke at the beginning that Ubuntu turned 13 and some of these strange new features you know, popped up where there weren't features before. Um, and we all remember, I'm sure, very, very fondly um, puberty, but um, puberty also is uh, adolescence. And adolescence is where we not just suddenly get way bigger and become an adult, um, but where we, adolescence is where we reevaluate our relationship with ourselves and our uh, peers and parents and our community. And so as Ubuntu um, heads towards the 3.5 year mark in April, um, that's exactly what's happened. We've, uh, we've gotten closer to upstream. We've, uh, we're shipping uh, you know, more vanilla packages. We have better ways to, um, if I told you 10 years ago that Microsoft was going to specifically package Skype for Ubuntu and ship it, uh, and that's the exact same code that's running on the phone and on Windows and on Mac is running on Ubuntu in a container that Microsoft supports. Everyone would look, everyone would have looked at me like I was crazy. And because of the work Ubuntu did with Snaps, that same program should work. I don't know if it works on 1404, but that 1604 package works on 1710 and 1804 with no extra work on Microsoft's behalf, which is the way they like it, and uh, no extra work really on our behalf, on the end user's behalf, which is how end users like it. So uh, as we continue forward and we start charting a, a path of what's new for Ubuntu, we have a really, really strong, stable uh, basis to make that. So um, I hope that gave you some context as to where we've been, where, we're, where we are, and where we're going. Thank you very much. And um, <laughs> mm -hmm. so um, we are actually, of course, we, Ubuntu has a booth uh, at the Expo floor, which uh, starts in, I don't know what time it is, in one, I can't read, in one and a half hours, we'll be there, we'll be Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we do have uh, computers with uh, the development version of 1804 um, running uh, on System76 hardware. Thank you so much, System76. We have um, 1710, and we are prepared to answer any and all questions. And uh, I think I have five minutes, so if anyone has any questions now, I can answer them here as well. <coughs> Although, as regards questions. Yeah, we have. At 3 o'clock, when we come back here, we have a whole session, the annual tradition of the ask anything you want. It's ideal if it's about Ubuntu, but it could be about anything. But it's the Ubuntu Q&A, ask anything you want. We'll do our best to answer it. If we can't answer it, we'll try to find it. But that's what we're doing at 3 o'clock here after our extended lunch. Yeah, so, yeah, we definitely, so while it's lunchtime, we, you know, we know the expo, expo floor does open at, uh, at 2, so we're not making anyone come back here to give a talk. You don't have to feel guilty. Go look at the floor. You've got an hour. You can come back. Uh, if anyone has questions about uh, Ubuntu or GNOME or anything like that right now, I'm happy to answer them. Um, if you need some time to think as you wander the expo floor, maybe look at the Ubuntu booth, you can come back and ask those same questions as well at 3. So, uh, yes, question. I was just curious about um, uh, maybe other platforms. Uh, my daughter uses, um, a, a, you know, a Linux Mint, um, and I'm, I use, you know, Ubuntu. My wife, you know, so I'm just wondering what is, I know it's based on, uh, you know, the those packages are ba based on uh, Ubuntu. What you know, what kind of support or will she, <laughs> will she need or will she? I mean, what, what do you? I mean, what's what's the, the plan forward for other? Distro, distros for you know, um, and I'm just trying to figure. You know, my, I'm just trying to figure out what you know, what, what I should do for that. 
you're recording a little so, so you use Linux Mint now, right? We have we have both. We have both uh, you know, mm -hmm. Ubuntu fourteen oh four and then and okay. then Linux Linux Mint and then we have the Windows ten and whatever else. So uh Linux Mint I can't speak to. They go off, they take Ubuntu and they go off and do their own thing and have their own security updates and so um I usually don't recommend people use Linux Mint unless they really know what they're doing um and, and are willing to say um that some security updates uh and fixes may not be available and, and they're gonna I think there's a backports thing or something that you can enable them, but um um Ubuntu just does it for you, so that's it. Uh when it comes to Ubuntu support, um if you have fourteen oh four, you can definitely upgrade directly to 16.4.4, uh, which is the newest version. Uh, I don't know if I gave the booth ISOs. Well, I'm going to be at the booth later, I think, for a little bit. Um, we're going to have ISOs. If you bring a thumb drive, we can give you an ISO 16.4.4, which is 16.04 with all the updates rolled in um, since April 2006, or 2016, as of March 1st was when it was released, so less downloading once you install. Um, you can go from 1404 to 1604, um, then you have three years to determine whether or not you're going to migrate to 1804. Um, like I said, we work really hard to make the interface very similar so that, uh, and familiar so that um, we're going to reduce documentation uh, load as far as teaching new users and training and so on. So if that didn't answer your question, uh, see me after this or at the booth. Um, was, you talked about the snaps and of course the, the new Unity desktop. How much have you done in terms of performance drop off or is there even better performance because it's been better optimized um, compared to the For original Unity? Well, it's both, it's two parts. It's snaps um, compared to, you know, native packaging versus running the snaps because there's compression and all that's involved with it. Is there a performance loss at all when you're packaging an app like that? Good question. So uh, is there a performance loss with Snaps? Um, the answer is that the first time you install Snap and you run it, um, the app armor uh, uh, profiles get compiled and then so you click and you're like, hmm, and then 20, 15, 10 seconds later, Snap opens up. And then you click and two seconds later it opens up every other time, right? Um, that's something they're working on. Now as far as the Snap being entirely compressed and then having, um, being needed to be constantly decompressed, uh, I don't know if they're using hardware acceleration for that, but in, in practice, uh, computers are so fast and we have multi-cores that um, I certainly haven't seen any performance changes uh, in snaps myself. I haven't run benchmarks, but it, it's, um, uh, it's, it's comparable. You can't tell. Um, of course, I, I run my home folders uh, encrypted and everything's being decrypted on the fly too. So um, that's the kind of thing where um, luckily computers have gotten so fast that that is easy stuff for computers. Um, I'm not aware of uh, performance problems related to that. Oh, and then also about the, uh, the Unity desktop with the new s the switching to GNOME as the, I guess, the, the back end for that. Is, that. is there a performance loss there, or is it faster compared to the old? Um, the lenses are a little bit faster in GNOME, um, but they have, a, they have a, 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 a daemon that runs in the background that constantly indexes your files. We have it turned off by default uh, in 1710 and 1804. You can, you can install, I think, Tracker D, and it just it's running. So it's a little heavy when you first log in. We're looking at enabling that in the future by default and making that less of a performance problem. Um, you will find that, um, I think in many ways GNOME shells a little bit faster actually. Um, uh, I'm, I love Unity, I'm happy to wait, but uh, a little I've used GNOME shell, it's been, been very snappy. So, All right. Um, you want to bring it to three? Oh, okay. Will snaps become the, um, are becoming the default in 17.10.2? Or is it 18.04? Where, where does that start? So Debian packages will never go away because that's how Ubuntu gets made. Okay, um, snaps are an alternative. In fact, the great thing about snaps is um, because they're modular, they're all self-contained, they're atomically updating, and they're completely sandboxed um, in location, if not uh, in what they can access, although several are. Um, so Ubuntu ships with LibreOffice. And if you want the new LibreOffice, you can install the Snap version. And if you don't want to abandon LibreOffice 5.0 for 6.0, instead of going out and getting the PPA and installing and everything else gets uninstalled and reinstalled, right? Um, the Debian packages and Snap packages run side by side. There's, not only is there no conflict, there can't be conflict because Snaps are separate. So you can literally test drive it, see how it is. And actually in 1804 will be a new option during a fresh install as a minimal, on a desktop image, minimal install, which is, 
actual full complete Ubuntu install, uh, but without, um, uh, and you get a, a desktop web browser, a couple games utilities, but you don't have LibreOffice, you have all these other things. So if you know you want the LibreOffice snap, you can install a, a lighter, slightly lighter version of Ubuntu and just go for the snap. So, but yeah, the devs will always be around. All right, everybody, enjoy your lunch and yep. enjoy the opening of the expo floor, and we'll be back here at 3.